So again, I wanna welcome everyone tonight and thank you again for making the time. Tonight's We Will Travel Again events will visit the three most popular capitals in Europe uh, for travelers to visit, certainly from this country. Um, and they are London, Paris, and Rome. I am not joined by a guest tonight. Instead, you get all me all the time tonight. And I'm gonna be telling you a lot about these places, but there's so much more to talk about than even what I'm gonna squeeze into tonight's hour. So if any of these places are on your wish list, by all means, let's talk, okay? So we're gonna get started and we're going to head to London first. London is a really great place to visit, I have to tell you. Um, there's a lot of great reasons to go to London. We're only gonna skim the surface. Um, the most popular attractions in the city are kind of what you'd expect, right? There's the Tower of London, Tower Bridge, Buckingham Palace, the British Museum, which will blow you away if you let it, and of course, seeing Big Ben and Parliament. Um, but there's also two other favorites of mine, and that's Westminster Abbey and the London Eye, which is that giant Ferris wheel in the middle of this picture. One of the great things about London is it's so easy to get around. So we're gonna talk about it at the end. There's so many ways to visit these places, but it really is an easy city to get around in. The, the terrain is flat, they have an excellent subway system called the underground or also they also call it the tube um, so easy to navigate of course they have other mass transit like those famous red double-decker buses one other thing that kind of came from the double-decker bus thing in london is a hop on hop off that's what the ho ho is for on the slide hop on hop off tour buses which is also a great way to get around and of course walking and taxis so if you intend to go as an independent traveler to London, again, whether you go for a weekend or a week or longer, it's a really great place to get around and get immersed. So we're gonna talk about those top attractions. The number one attraction in London is the Tower of London. And in this picture, you'll see the four corners of the tower and inside, and it sits inside of a fortified um, wall. It's like a fortress inside of a fortress and it's right along the river. And you could easily spend the better part of a day at the Tower of London. There's so much to see here and there's so much to kind of soak in. The, um, the mascots of the place are the, crow, are, are the ravens. Um, the ravens have a special place at the Tower of London. And the gentlemen that give the tours and are the most amazing storytellers are the yeoman warders. They're also called the beef eaters. Um, and you can wander around on your own inside the Tower of London and see the sites that are there. But I absolutely encourage you when you're there to lean into any of their talks. They're stationed throughout um, the castle grounds and they have such fascinating stories to tell you about the, the, the immense amount of history that's here. Um, famous names you know, you know, famous moments in history, some of them gruesome and scary and some of them not so much. Um, but it, they really have um, a wonderful job, you know, I mean, and they love it. They love to give all the tourists the, this taste of one of their pride of place. Now, of course, the other thing um, in the Tower of London um, is the crown jewels. And if you've never been, I can tell you no amount of imagining what crown jewels are will ever be what you will see actually in real life. <laughs> when you get there. It's not just the crown or even the regalia of state, right? When Queen Elizabeth II was, had her coronation many years ago, she had a crown, she had like a lapel full of beautiful jewels, she held a scepter and a globe. There's like one for each of the kings and queens that ever lived. There's so much glitz and glamour. There's so many things in this, in this space to see. So it's absolutely worth standing in the extra queue and going into what is ostensibly a giant safe, it's a huge room, and seeing this amazing amount of gems and giant diamonds and all this other stuff. Um, it really is quite dazzling. I mean, I, I can't even explain it properly. But like I said, the storytelling that's here, fabulous, the crown jewels, of course. There's also a really impressive arms and armory exhibit inside the Tower of London, which makes sense, right? Um, so, you know, the suits of armor and like a whole huge collection of 
lances and spears and all these weapons of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Different things appeal to different people, naturally. There's also a great tea shop and a wonderful gift shop. Um, and like I said, you know, there's so much story here. Um, whether it's the story of the beheading of Anne Boleyn or the princes that were locked away in the tower or what is the deal with the ravens. Um, the legend says that if the ravens ever leave the tower, the empire will fall. So they take very good care of their ravens at the Tower of London. Just outside the Tower of London is the view of Tower Bridge. Um, and it's, it's just a little ways up the, up the river. And you can enjoy this just from the outside because it is quite beautiful, especially on a sunny day. It's also lit up very beautifully in the evening, but you can take a tour inside the Tower of London. Um, that's my cat screaming. Um, <laughs> so you can go inside and get a tour of the West Tower. You can walk across this, this suspended catwalk here. And in this picture up here in the corner, you can see part of that little overhanging area has a glass floor. It's not for the faint of heart. I mean, I know it's not that tall, but still this woman is standing over glass, taking a picture through the glass past her feet of the traffic on the lower deck of the roadway. So it's a cool thing to do. You can also see the mechanism that causes the bridge to open and close because it is a functional drawbridge. Lots of really cool things to see right here. It right here, it's a great way to spend the day. Um, between the Tower of London and the Tower Bridge. I think this is another kind of quintessential London vision we all have, Buckingham Palace. And whether you're um, able to visit when there's a trooping of the color, or you just managed to get there when there is a changing of the guard, these fellows in their red suits with their big bare fur hats um, are on duty. Uh, they're on sentry and they are there to be impressive. Um, when the queen is in residence, there are no tours. And you can always tell that because that's when the Union Jack is flying over the top. Um, but when she's not in residence, perhaps she's off at another castle, um, they do offer tours. Sometimes that has to be a spontaneous decision, sometimes not. But if this is something on your wish list, talk to your friendly neighborhood travel agent. There are some fantastic world-class museums in London. And I think the gem of them is the British Museum. This is the inner courtyard. Um, the British Museum has in it some of the most important things, um, works of art and artifacts for like 5,000 years of human history. It's a really impressive museum. And it has one of the largest collections of Egyptian art outside of Egypt. So if you're interested in that, this is a must do for you. The most important piece of their collection that is from Egypt is the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was found during the Napoleonic era and it was kind of just holding up a wall. They were using this big stone as kind of um, building fodder. But what it really was originally when it was made was an announcement. It was, um, it's inscribed with an announcement and it dates back to the Ptolemaic period, which is between Alexander the Great and Cleopatra. And the thing that made this Rosetta Stone so special, of course, is because it has the same announcement inscribed in three languages, top, bottom, and middle. And you can kind of tell from the picture, even though it's teeny tiny, that there's a difference between the top, bottom, and the middle. It's not the size, it's actually the characters that are used. The bottom part is Greek, which people could read. The middle part is Demotic, which was kind of a lost language, largely so. But the top was hieroglyphics and no one knew how to read them. And it was through years, years, years of people studying this and linguists studying it and code breakers studying it that like nearly a hundred years later, maybe a little more than a hundred years, somebody finally was able to decipher hieroglyphics based on the Greek and the demotic from this artifact. So this has got pride of place in the collection at the British Museum. It's rather large. It's, uh, it's not quite as big as a car, but it's pretty big. Um, other major, major part of their collection um, are the marbles from the Acropolis in Athens. These are the Parthenon marbles that were 
taken under dubious circumstances many years ago and brought back to London by Lord Elgin. Um, and the room that they're kept in, in the British Museum is the size and relative shape of the Parthenon. So even though they're at eye level, as opposed to being way up above your head, because that's where they would have been in ancient times, you get to appreciate them up close. And an amazing set of sculptures, again, that just kind of plucked from history and brought into this wonderful museum. The museum's filled with stuff like that and from all over the world, all over the world, all different cultures in Africa, um, Australia, Asia, there's so many things at the British Museum. So if you have an interest in any of that stuff, you know, do a little pre-planning and head over to the British Museum. It's one of the top five museums in the world. So naturally, this is an icon of London, and no one could mistake what it possibly is, Mr. Big Ben. Um, of course, Big Ben is not the name of the building. It's actually the name of the biggest bell inside the building um, in the clock tower. And in the sun, it glistens and sparkles because there is so much gold going on on the top, on the exterior. Um, it really is a spectacle when it's, um, when it's all lit up from the sparkling sun sun. Right now, and for a couple of years, it's been kind of smothered in scaffolding because they are doing some really important restoration work. Um, I did a, I took a little zoom in of some of the things that they're working on. There's a lot of fine detail that you might not be able to see well from the street. Um, but when she reopens, there will be tours again, both inside. And of course you can see her better outside um, once the scaffolding comes down. I think it's supposed to come down in 2023. Just across the street from Big Ben and Parliament is Westminster Abbey. This is one of my favorite places in London. Um, of course, it is well known because a lot of very important things happen at Westminster Abbey, not the least of which was the wedding of Kate and William. But also this is where Prince, uh, where uh, Elizabeth II was at her coronation. Actually, many kings and queens are coronated. The coronation chair is here. It's a beautiful, beautiful church inside and out. Um, it's, its architecture is beautiful, its stained glass is beautiful, all the details inside are just amazing to look at. And it's, um, it's got a ton of history and monuments inside that are kind of mind blowing, really. Um, the architecture itself, like I said, is just stunning. There are monuments inside, um, the most famous of which is probably Poet's Corner. Poets Corner is just an area where there are some monuments. There are, I believe, a couple of people interred directly here. But it started rather simply, you know, all you need is a monument to William Shakespeare and a few other famous British writers in the same nook. And all of a sudden, in and of itself, is a little bit of a tourist spot. Um, people like Lewis Carroll, the Bronte sisters, of course, William Shakespeare, and others have monuments right here at Poets Corner. There's another area of the church called the Ladies' Chapel, and that's where several monarchs are interred, including Queen Elizabeth I. There's some beautiful stained glass in that little area, and some of that is dedicated to the, um, the armed forces. There's a beautiful window that's dedicated to the Royal Air Force, for example. So there's lots of little details inside a church that's filled with beautiful views. Um, this is looking back towards the front um, of the church and you see this big beautiful rose window up here and all the stained glass. There's lots of architectural details in here, um, not just in the main church, there's a lot to see in the main church, but there's also a cloister next door and a chapter house and other little parts of this church complex. So lots to see here and appreciate, um, including the, the choir and all these other pieces and parts. So. It's a beautiful spot to spend some quality time. They even have a, a bunch of scientists um, either interred or have memorials here like Sir Isaac Newton, um, for example. So uh, lots to see in there. This is a much more recent addition to the London skyline. And this is of course the London Eye. It's called, also called the Millennium Eye. Um, it was built for the year 2000. And it was really only supposed to have like a two or three year run before they were going to take it apart, do whatever else with it. But it, it became so popular, not just with tourists, but with Londoners, that the city granted it a permanent extension. It's not for me because I don't like heights. However, it does offer fantastic views. The, each 
pod, this is one of the pods, looks like this on the inside. There's a nice big bench and you have views and it holds at least 15 people. I forget what the top number is, it might be around 20, um, but it's pretty sizable. And the way it works is this looks like a giant bike tire, right? It's got spokes, it's got a fork, um, but each, each of these pods are affixed to the exterior of the circle. And if you see in the smaller picture, these kind of rings around it, the pods rotate like little rotisserie chickens <laughs> around the giant wheel as it moves. So naturally you don't move around inside the wheel. You're always standing up, right? It's another one of these like really brilliant things um, to appreciate. And obviously it looks so pretty at night, but it does have spectacular views. It's uh, one of the tallest things in town that you can enjoy. There are so many things, so many things in London. Um, cultural highlights, like I said, world-class museums, whatever floats your boat. I know I say that a lot, but you know, if you're interested in science, um, different periods of art, the Tate Modern is here. Um, there's the National Portrait Gallery. The Victoria and Albert Museum has really neat stuff. Um, just one thing after another. So if you are interested in anything about art or history, there are a ton of museums in London. Um, there's also this replica of Shakespeare's Globe Theater. If you've ever seen the movie Shakespeare in Love, imagine going to a play right here and seeing it, um, living it, you know. Um, there's also other churches in town that are beautiful to see, like St. Paul's Cathedral. There is a lot of history here. Um, it goes way back. I know that's an overgeneralization, but quite a bit of World War II history here, like the Churchill War Rooms. There's a naval um, museum in town as well. There's a battleship um, docked right in the Thames. And there's Kensington Palace. So even if you can't get into Buckingham Palace, I would go to Kensington Palace. That's got um, kind of a longer history or richer history. A lot more stories going on over there. There are some hidden gems in London too. Um, if you are um, interested in, and this all goes back to your why. Why do you want to go to London? What, what's your motivation? What's your passion saying about take me to London? Um, I do a lot of reading and I love art. So that tends to be why I go on vacations. Um, and there's this great Sherlock Holmes Museum that is at 221B Baker Street, where it should be. And downstairs on the ground floor is Mrs. Hudson's Tea Room. And when you go up into the rooms, it looks like Watson and Sherlock just left. And it's filled with all these kind of artifacts from the stories that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote. It really is a very unique little spot. Um, there's also more contemporary things like the Harry Potter Studios tour. Um, that is sets and props and costumes and things related to the films of Harry Potter. And it's become extremely popular. Um, there's so many, like I said, so many reasons to go um, to London and, and there are little gems all over the place. The bottom picture is of the Templar Church, which um, if you've read um, The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, that's actually what inspired me to find this place. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful little church and it's dedicated to the Knights Templar. It's very unusual. And in this quiet little courtyard, it, it feels like you're in another place altogether, not in the heart of this big bustling city. So it's important to kind of explore the things that are interesting to you as you plan a vacation and talk to that with your travel agent. So of course, there's lots of things you can do like the locals do, not the least of which is shopping. Um, everybody wants to go to Harrods, you should check it out. It's a very unusual and very special um, store. I always buy things that are local brands, right? The, the things that England is known for in this case, right? Um, you can go to famous stores, not just Harrods, um, James Smith and Sons Umbrella Shop, right? And you always picture every English gentleman walking around with an umbrella. Um, and there are great gift shops where, in all the tourist sites. Um, I pick up things everywhere I go, whether it's ornaments or art or, um, or pretty scarves, all sorts of things. The foodie experience, a lot of people don't really think of England and London as a place for food, but we all kind of are familiar with kind of pub grub, right? The, 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 the things that you do associate with England, like fish and chips, bangers and mash, that kind of stuff. Absolutely enjoy lunch or dinner in a pub and have the kind of typical thing, but then also enjoy a full English breakfast every morning. Every morning. 
Um, you're going to need it to kind of keep you going. It's a great big plate of food and it's delicious. Um, but there are also things that are kind of considered the national dish, right? Like we might, you know, we all kind of imagine that to be true in different places, but things like beef Wellington, honestly, I, I still to this day, like the best piece of steak I've ever eaten in my life I had there in beef Wellington. Um, chicken tikka masala, fantastic, right? Fantastic Indian food in London, stands to reason, right? Um, and of course, afternoon tea, right? Indulge in the kind of things that make sense to do while you're in these places. There's also a great theater district here in the West End, and don't be afraid to do a pub crawl. Um, these are all fun things to do um, while you're out and about in London. So we're gonna move on to Paris. Now you can actually do these two cities in the same trip pretty easily, I have. Um, you can fly between them or you can train between them because there is a train that goes under the English Channel, it comes out on the other side. But we're gonna talk about them as independently uh, separate trips tonight. So of course in Paris, as you might imagine, the Eiffel Tower is the number one attraction, thing to see and do, along with the Louvre Museum, the Cathedral of Notre Dame, the, the other most famous church is Sacré-Cœur, and that's in the, the neighborhood of Montmartre. And of course, strolling the Champs-Élysées up to the Arc de Triomphe. Just outside the city, it requires an excursion. You do have to kind of do put in a little effort to get there, um, but you can certainly arrange that with your travel agent. It is a trip to the Palace of Versailles. There are so many beautiful parks and gardens in Paris. Um, it, it has a very... Um, outdoor, they love being outside kind of vibe to it. There's parks all over the place, lots of trees, lots of greenery. They even just did a big campaign to add more greenery to this Champs-Élysées. So it has a very park-like feel to the city. And uh, none of the buildings are very tall. Um, so it's a beautiful place to just stroll. And that actually is kind of a Parisian pastime, right? Um, and strolling along the river as well. Getting around in Paris is nearly as easy as getting around to London, as in London, as far as I'm concerned. They also have a fantastic subway called the Metro. Um, in Paris, I use the hop on hop off bus as another means of transportation. All the cities that have those buses are about $35 a day for tickets. You get earbuds that tell you where you are and what you're seeing so you can kind of orient yourself in the city. But you can also use them to get from one tourist attraction to another because that's where they're, that's where they're driving. Um, and of course, it's a great place for walking and strolling and taxis are a great way to get around as well. So the Eiffel Tower is beautiful from the ground. I can tell you that because I won't go up in it, but it is um, kind of a marvel to look at. I mean, just getting up underneath it and really understanding how big it is because we, always, we have to see it in far away photographs to see the whole thing. Um, but when you're up to it, it's very, very impressive and beautiful. Um, if you are interested in going up in it, there can be very long queues. So you wanna get timed tickets to go in. Again, talk to me, I'd be happy to help you. But you don't have to go all the way to the top. You can go to the first tier or the second or all the way to the top. Um, and there is a way to do it with elevators and lifts. You can do, you can do steps to the first tier if you want. I don't know why you would do that, but you could. <laughs> but at any rate, the further up you go, of course, the better your view. And this picture up on top here kind of gives you an idea of how huge your view can be um, the further up you go. It's in a beautiful park setting, you know, and it's all the things you expect it to be. Um, but it isn't cheesy. I have to tell you, you know, sometimes people think, you know, oh, that, isn't that so typical? Do I really want to do that? Yeah, you really do. It's like, don't go to Venice and not take a gondola ride. You want to do these things. This is the Louvre Museum. It's got to be the biggest museum in the world. And I say that with some confidence because I swear I put six miles on my feet the day I was there. Let me give you an idea of its size. So if you, right in the middle of the picture, you can see a tower, like a corner of the building. And over on, towards the left, you can see a matching tower. They connect, right? There's this whole kind of square between them around the pyramid, the glass pyramid. But that's only half the museum. The other half of the museum goes from the tower in the middle all the way to the right and to another tower that didn't even fit in my photograph. And the matching side of it over here, because here's the little tower on this end. 
it is an enormous museum. Um, you can easily spend a lifetime in this museum. Um, I always recommend having a plan before you go. If you wanna just hit the highlights, that's easy. You can do a highlights only tour. You can do it with a tour guide. So you have somebody to follow around to get you from point A to point B. You can do an independent highlights tour with like an audio guide um, and, and, a, and a map, or you can do longer ones. And they, they offer them in different, um, em, with different emphases, emphases. Um, you know, so if there's a, there's a type of art you're interested in or a period in time you're interested in, you can kind of customize your trip. So you don't have to feel lost in this massive building that was once a palace. That's how it, that's how big it is. It's palatial, right? Um, so you don't have to see it all. You don't have to be intimidated by it, but you should absolutely go and hit the highlights. Um, the entrance is under this glass pyramid, which like the Eiffel Tower, when it was first built, the Parisians thought it was just a tragic eyesore. Um, and of course they came to love that. This too was thought of as a tragic eyesore. What on earth have they done? Um, but it was part of when they renovated part of the museum so they could build a new entrance. So you actually enter through the pyramid and you go downstairs and, and uh, work your way up back through the museum. Um, but not to be um, kind of intimidated by it, there are some really important works of art here to see. Um, there's some really important French art here, not just by a French painter or sculptor, but art that is important to France's history. That's a, a big cornerstone of the art that's here. This is the painting of Liberty Leading the People. If you've ever seen Les Mis, this looks familiar, right? It's that moment in time painted right around that moment in time. So this has become kind of the national painting of France. And there's also this little lady, of course, the Mona Lisa is here. Um, this is the thing that most people associate with the Louvre. She's a little smaller than you might expect, partly because there's so much hype around her, right? You want her to be 10 feet tall. Everybody talks about her. She's this petite little painting and you do have to stand in a queue to see her. Otherwise people would just be standing there all day gawking at her. Um, so they do kind of keep the line moving. So you have a chance to look at her, but you know, it keeps the crowds going. She is rather beautiful. I always explain to people, you have to respect the fact that she's behind a velvet rope and bulletproof glass because there are crazy people in the world. So know that going in. So you're not like shocked, oh my gosh, she's behind bulletproof glass and she's small, but she really is quite beautiful. She's not the only Leonardo da Vinci painting here. There's actually a couple more in the next room and they are also absolutely worth your time and attention. Again, in this museum, there are just centuries of artwork, centuries of artwork, not just Renaissance masters, um, like you name it, it's here. Even the lowest level of the museum has the original fortress or walls that you can see from medieval times that were once there that then the palace was built over top of. So there's, there's history of the museum in the museum. And then there's ancient stuff and modern stuff these are just two of the most famous ancient sculptures that are there, the Venus de Milo and the Nike of Samothrace. These are masterpieces of classical and Hellenistic art from ancient Greece. And they too have their stories. The Venus de Milo during World War II was hidden behind two false walls in the museum so that the Germans who were looting would not find her and take her. You know, there's all these kind of great stories about um, various bits and pieces. And you get that when you take a tour. I will, I will absolutely say that. You get more when you take a tour. Um, but again, just a magnificent museum, so much to see. And there are plenty of other museums in Paris. Again, of all different sorts, not just art. This is of course Notre Dame. And unless you've been hiding under a rock for two years, you know that there was a tragic fire uh, that tore through Notre Dame. I believe it was April of 2019, um, and her roof suffered a massive um, suffered massive damage. But you can still see her from the outside, even though you can't really go in right now. The facade up front is amazing. Um, they did some very significant restorative work to the facade in 1998, and I remember that because that's when I went and I couldn't see the facade. Um, 
But there's a million little sculptures in each archway. Um, there's the gargoyles perched across each of these terraces. And of course, there's bells in the bell tower. The front is still quite stunning. Um, and even though you can't really appreciate the rose windows because that is to be appreciated from the inside, you can certainly appreciate the outside. This photograph is from the side before the fire. Um, the fire took down the, the, the tower that's in the top here, the, this spindle in the middle, and took a big bite out of the middle of the roof um, from the length of the church. But still, it's a masterpiece of Gothic engineering. You can see the flying buttresses. It's amazing that the glass is intact um, throughout. So while they spend a great deal of time and an enormous amount of effort and money to restore this beautiful and magnificent church that they truly consider to be not just um, an icon of Paris, but a national treasure, um, it's still worth visiting, even if you can't go inside. And of course, this is you know Paris in the springtime. Uh, it's a wonderful time to visit. The other very famous church in the city is Sacré-Cœur, and this is up on top of the hill in Montmartre. Montmartre is a beautiful neighborhood. Um, it doesn't feel quite like the hustle and bustle of the Champs-Élysées and some of the other areas in town, and there are other neighborhoods, um, even, even where Notre Dame is. The, it feels different than some of the other parts of the city, um, but Montmartre is this beautiful neighborhood. If you've ever seen um, the movie Moulin Rouge with Nicole Kidman and Ewan McGregor. They had this whole kind of story about how they were in the bohemian side of town and this is where the artists and the writers were. This is like that. This really is that kind of vibe here. There's wonderful cafes. Well, there's cafes everywhere in France, but um, beautiful cafes at night. There's little plazas where you can buy, you know, you can meet with artists and buy some of their work. It really has this quaint different neighborhood feel, even though you're in the middle of the most bustling city in the country. And it is hilly. That Mont and Montmartre is Mount. <laughs> um, and of course, there's the Champs-Élysées. If you've ever watched anything that featured anybody driving in Paris, they were on the street. Um, and with the Arc de Triomphe. The Arc de Triomphe is actually in a traffic circle, which is crazy. I don't know why anybody would drive there. It looks like bedlam. Um, but the Champs-Élysées is the broadest avenue. It's got the most fantastic shopping, right? It's where all the, the fine um, shopping is. Of course, you know, the, the French designers all have stores there. Um, it's kind of like the equivalent of New York's Fifth Avenue, except it's France. Um, and like I said before, they've really done more to even make it greener. Um, a big campaign, millions and millions and millions of euros spent to do it. Um, other things you can see on this street, if you're there at the right time, if you are interested in the Tour de France, it ends right here. Um, so it is kind of a hub, right, um, in Paris. Not far from the city, but it does require an excursion, is the Palace of Versailles. What I can tell you about the Palace of Versailles is not as much as some other things. This is just one tiny little courtyard of it. It's a massive piece of property. It's got gardens um, and it's got some of the most ornate rooms I've ever even heard of, much less seen. Um, it's, it's the absolute living end of um, kind of over the top rich. So you can certainly see why the peasant class wanted to storm the castle, so to speak. And, have a revolution, right? They're dying of starvation in the streets and the king and queen are over here, let them eat cake. So it's pretty easy to understand things once you kind of start to see them. <laughs> um, you can do this with a private, a private guide or an audio tour. So it depends on like your level of interest, how much time you want to spend. There's different ways to enjoy uh, Versailles. You can, right now, of course, and this is true for most things, because of the way the world has been for the last 15 or so months, most of these things have been closed. Um, but I can tell you, almost everything I mentioned in London is reopening this month. And Versailles, you could visit the gardens. Like I said, they're magnificent. Um, but they haven't set yet a date. But a lot, the museums, like the Louvre, reopen. Like, so all these places are reopening. Um, so if you have aspirations of going, it's not because things are going to be still closed. So um, that's good news. There's plenty of other cultural highlights um, in Paris. Like I said, tons of museums. Are you interested in opera or the ballet? If that's something that 
is a passion for you, work with your travel agent. We'll align your trip with those seasons and get you tickets. Um, like I said, lots of history in Paris. A great deal of it is from World War II forward, um, but um, there's, there's Napoleonic memorials like the Arc de Triomphe and other things, lots of palaces and stuff to appreciate all those kings and queens from old. And here too, hidden gems. The picture on the bottom of your screen is Saint-Chapelle. It is mind-blowingly beautiful. It is a small church, really small. It's, it's tiny, but it's tall. And it really does look like it's entirely made of glass. How on earth could it hold up the stone and, and its stone ceiling? How, 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 how? It's the flying buttresses outside. But when you're inside, your jaw is on the floor and everybody is walking around going, wow. It's especially if it's beautiful day outside and the, the stained glass is all lit up. It is breathtaking. The other thing that's a little odd in Paris, well, I don't say it's odd, other places have it, but odd that I've been to are the catacombs. It's not everybody's cup of tea, I grant you. However, like many places in Europe and, and places that have kind of challenges when it comes to how much land they're going to devote to those who have already passed on, a long time ago, Paris, the Parisians decided to disinter their long since deceased in cemeteries and reinter them in catacombs beneath the city. And the, the, the geography of the geology of the city is such that they can have an awesome subway network and catacombs. And you can visit the catacombs. Now, of course, you can only do this with a guided tour because you do not want to get lost down there. That's like a whole other level of creepy I couldn't handle. But it is actually pretty fascinating. And I have to say, I learned something about myself that day. I was not bothered by being surrounded by thousands and thousands and thousands of skulls. <laughs> But it really was more interesting than I thought it would be. It was kind of a lark to do it, but it was interesting. Ah, so let's talk a little bit about the food. There's really nothing I can say about the food other than you should really indulge in it, um, whether it's a real baguette. I mean, you could just live on baguettes and cheese in Paris. You don't really need to go crazy, right? Just get a bottle of wine. You don't have to spend a lot of money, right? I mean, it's local. Get the local vino, um, but of course there are they have sweets, right? Chocolate tears and um, you know baked delicious yummy things like macarons and uh, all the other amazing food. I mean, indulge. That's one of the things I always try to impress upon people who go to France. It's it's sometimes it, it gets hard to say, but it's expensive. Hey, look, you're in Paris. Treat yourself. Not every night. You know you don't have to go bonkers every day, but enjoy everything you know go to a michelin starred restaurant one night what do you have to lose you're going to have a magnificent meal and you're building memories that's really something that's important in all this travel right it's not just doing it to do it you're having an experience of a lifetime don't cut it short because oh, well, if i was home i wouldn't spend this much money on dinner well okay but you're not home <laughs> um of course like I said, fine dining and wine, but there's other things to do at night. Most people have heard of the Moulin Rouge, of course. Um, it, that cabaret show is world famous and it's been around for a very long time. Um, they have had in the past two shows, an early show and a late show. The early show I would say is rated PG. The late show is not, I'm not saying it's naughty or anything, but it's, you know, you don't want to bring your maybe 12 year old or so to that one. Um, but certainly it's a bit of an extravagant thing to do. It's dinner and a show, but there are ways to have that experience and have it suit your budget. You can do it with a three course meal with wine or without. You can do a five course meal with champagne or without. There's different ways to make it work. So talk to your agent. If that's an experience you want to have, there's a way to make it happen for you. Um, there's also dinner cruises on the scene. Paris is beautiful at night. It's all lit up, the monuments, the bridges, the Eiffel Tower, it's gorgeous. They call it the city of lights for a reason. Take a dinner cruise. Depending on the time of year, it might be dusk, it could be a little darker out, um, you know, if it's later in the year, but take a dinner cruise. Here too, you know, it's a, it's a price fixed meal. So you know what you're spending on it going in. Odds are you're gonna purchase in advance your ticket and you can have it suit your budget and have this wonderful experience. 
I absolutely recommend it, especially it's great for celebrating like a birthday, a retirement, um, an anniversary, but it's also a great way to spend your last night in Paris. Why not? All right, I'm actually doing pretty good on time. I'm proud of myself, but I am gonna run a little long. But now we're off to my favorite place, my happy place, and that is Rome. I'm really gonna do my best not to just keep talking and talking and talking about Rome, but I could. Okay, the most obvious popular attraction in Rome is the Colosseum, we'll talk about that. But in addition to that, it's also St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican Museum, and the Sistine Chapel. And those three things are part of Vatican City, which is a country inside the city of Rome. The Trevi Fountain is exceptionally popular. It's on everybody's uh, list of things to do. And the Pantheon. There is also just the experience of wandering around Rome. There's piazzas to enjoy, public art, people watching. I mean, just like in Paris, where you should totally sit in an outdoor cafe in Paris, have a little cup of coffee, maybe a little, a little sweet treat and watch people and live in the moment. The same is true here in Rome. Absolutely, sit down in an outdoor cafe or a piazza and watch the world go by, except while you're here, do it with a gelato. <laughs> there are many, 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 many churches in Rome and some of them have really remarkable um, secrets to share, whether it's relics or art or history. So lots of, uh, lots of that here as well, as you might expect. Getting around in Rome is a little more difficult um, compared to London, certainly, and to Paris. And there's a few reasons for that. They don't really have a great subway. The subway in Rome has only two lines. And part of that is because you can't stick a fork in the ground in Rome without having to excavate. Um, because there's, there's thousands of years of history right here in this very small area. Um, so their, met, their, their, their subway isn't super helpful necessarily. Um, you can get taxis, there's taxi stands around. I use the hop on hop off double decker bus here to help me get around um, a lot because again, it goes past all the sites and you can hop on and hop off. Um, it's not super walking friendly either. And the reason why I say that, it, it's, a, it's an expectation thing I wanna set for people is if you've ever heard the expression, the seven hills of Rome, it's because there are seven hills in Rome. It is a very hilly spot. Um, and because it's such an old city too, um, you get a lot of uneven terrain. So instead of there being like perfectly manicured sidewalks, a lot more cobblestones, a lot more uneven steps. So if you are not sure-footed, um, you know, you have to be a little more mindful. So you get a bit of a workout in Rome, walking around. And it's also further south than Paris and London. So if you go when it's warm, it's definitely hot. It's definitely hot, especially in the summertime in Rome. So a little bit more of a workout, but worth every mile on your feet. In all three of these destinations, smart shoes, please. No flip-flops, no lousy sneakers, good walking shoes. So let's talk about the Colosseum, which is the most obvious thing to see in town. Um, it is a feat of Roman engineering, and there are quite a few of them in town um, to appreciate. I think one of the things that is most impressive to know about the Colosseum is that what you see of it today only represents about a third of its original construction materials. There's that little of it left, and yet it still stands. Granted, this angle that you see on the upper picture is construction that was done, I think, in the 1300s to help shore it up so it wouldn't continue to crumble. Um, it, it fell into disuse centuries ago, and it became, you know, a quarry for um, rebuilding Rome centuries later. So a lot of its marble, um, a lot of the brickwork that was used um, to finish it out, carted off and used elsewhere. So it is very impressive from the outside. It's also lit up beautifully at night, um, but it's absolutely worth going in. Um, go inside the Colosseum and be impressed. This structure was built in 79, 72, 72 AD. It's old. And yet here she stands with only a third of her materials holding her up. Um, and it is truly the progenitor of our modern arenas. When she was complete, she held between 60 and 80,000 people 
it's like giant stadium. That's big. And of course she had um, concourses to get from, you know, the outside in. She, there was plumbing, there were bathrooms, there were concessions, all the things that you expect in a modern arena were here except the electricity. It really is impressive in so many ways. But when you go inside, you get to understand exactly how big it is. Um, and in the lower picture, you can tell there's so much of it missing. You know, I wish like crazy, of course, that it looked like it does in Gladiator, right? <laughs> I want it to look as whole and intact um, as it did in the movie Gladiator. It does not, sadly, no. Um, but they built this small section of flooring and a catwalk for um, the, the uh, Jubilee year. It was the year 2000 was the Jubilee year on the Roman Catholic calendar. And they built the catwalk and this little part of the arena floor. So you can actually stand a little bit in the arena um, to get a sense of what it might've been like to stand on um, that sand floor. I was actually lucky enough to walk on the catwalk. It has since been cordoned off to the public. Um, but I just read in the paper this week that the, um, the Ministry of Tourism and others have gotten finance, fin financing and approval to rebuild more of the floor. They're gonna build, I think they said a third of the floor um, and it should be done in the next two years so that the next time you go to Rome, you can stand on the Colosseum floor and shout at the stands like a gladiator. It's pretty cool. Um, what you see down inside is actually kind of the guts of the, of the arena, um, right? Where the animals were kept, where the gladiators hung out before they came out onto the floor, the horses, things like that. Um, and they do intend on keeping some of that exposed because you can take a tour down there as well and, uh, and understand how the mechanics of the place worked. It's a really impressive sight to see, but it's not the only thing in town. This is St. Peter's Basilica, is the seat of Roman Catholicism. It is where the Pope hangs out. This is his, this is his home, so to speak, right? This is home court. Um, this is the window right in the middle here under the main archway where he comes out and greets the masses, right? Christmas and Easter and other occasions. Um, the facade is enormous. The whole church, it's the biggest church, period, full stop. It's the biggest church in Christendom. Um, and after you kind of do your, you know, they like any museum or, or, you know, tourist attraction, they check your bags and, you know, you walk through a metal detector and stuff. Once you go inside, you thought it was big from the outside. It's ridiculous on the inside. Um, you, you, the upper picture is the inside. And there's always so many people milling around in here, but they look so tiny. Look at them. They look like little ants because the walls are so tall. The dome is so high and everything is the, this, covered in beautiful marbles and there's statues that are 15 feet tall. It's so big. <laughs> it's the biggest big thing. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, as you walk from the back of the church towards the altar, if you look at the floor of the main aisle every now and then, in, in, uh, in inlaid every so often, you'll see the name of another church like Notre Dame de Paris or St. Patrick's, New York. That is to indicate that that church could fit inside this church from there. That's nuts, it's crazy talk. Um, you can go up to the dome. You can take an elevator ride up to the dome. It's a magnificent view looking down into the church to see all these little ants walking around. You can also go up to the roof. Um, I've been up to the roof. Whoops, um, there's a gift shop on the roof run by nuns. I bought rosary beads in there for my grandmothers many years ago. Um, but you can look out onto the plaza in front. And I'm making big arms. If you can't see me, I'm making big arms because the plaza, this grand piazza is supposed to look like arms, right? It's the arms of the church. This is what fills in with thousands of people when the Pope does a mass. It fills in with thousands of people. It is an enormous piazza. Um, and it's everything about this is like the biggest home court advantage, kind of impressive, impressive, impressive. Um, the statues up on the roof are like 17 feet tall. You can't tell, of course, when you're standing in the piazza how big they are, but when you're standing next to them, oh my gosh, um, they're enormous. So everything about this church is like oversized. One of the things, of course, you wanna see when you're here is this. This is Michelangelo's Pieta. 
whether you appreciate art or not, go stand in the queue and go look at the sculpture. It's exquisite. Um, I would imagine right now, if you were to go, there's a queue that you walk past it. But in the past, um, you'd kind of walk up to it and kind of wiggle your way to the front in a crowd of people to get a glimpse of her. So I'm sure with social distancing, they've had to change that. But this statue sits in a niche behind a stone balustrade and again, um, bulletproof glass because some nut job actually took a sledgehammer to her hand. They had to repair her. Um, but it's breathtaking. Their life size, maybe a t if they feel a little bigger than life size because they had, Michelangelo had to sculpt her big so that it looked like she could support the weight of a grown man. Um, but the fabric looks real. It's marble. She looks like she could take a breath. It's so magnificent. If you're gonna go to see any public art of this magnitude, whether it's a Michelangelo or Da Vinci, like the Mona Lisa, or anything that, that strikes your fancy, don't do it to check it off a list. That's all I ask. When you get there, when you work your way through the crowd, take a few minutes and really enjoy it. Really absorb what you're looking at. The, the thing that drives me the most crazy when I'm in a museum or I'm standing in front of something like this, is somebody who walks right up to it, snaps a picture and walks away. Or worse, they walk right up to it, they turn their back on it, take a selfie, and then they walk away. This is not a checklist. You're not on a treasure hunt. Enjoy it. <laughs> Savor it, right? Indulge yourself in some of these things. You really, really should take the time to um, appreciate the thing that brought you here. Even if this wasn't on the top of your list, take the time. Give it the time it deserves. I'm not saying you have to set up shop and you know camp out there, but spend spend the time. Um, Donna, you're right. Um, she wasn't always behind plexiglass. I mean, a uh, bulletproof glass, and she wasn't so out of reach. Um, it's a shame that they've had to do that with so many works of art to make them um, a little more apart from us. Now, go over to the Vatican Museum, and this is the other most magnificent Michelangelo thing in town, and that is the Sistine Chapel's ceiling. Now, the Sistine Chapel, again, is a very small space. It's not actually all that different in size than Saint Chapelle over in Paris. It's a relatively narrow and long room with a very tall ceiling. You and everybody else in this room are walking around with your heads craned back, kind of bumping into each other because nobody's paying attention to who they're bumping into. It is a visual stimulation overload. You can't even imagine what you're looking at because it's so unbelievable. Um, they did some really fabulous restoration work on the, on the fresco um, a number of years ago. So if you had seen it before that, it was probably very dull compared to the way it looks today, where the colors are so vibrant, so bright. Um, but it is, it's a feast for the eyes. And Michelangelo painted the ceiling, and he also painted the altar wall, which you can kind of see over this lady's shoulder. It's mostly blue. Um, so those are, those are what Michelangelo painted. But there are other paintings um, in the lower register um, along the sides that are also wonderful. They're, um, but the whole room is overload. Again, don't feel like you're in a rush. Take your time. Soak it in. Um, I always tell my clients to do something a little silly, but they always thank me for the suggestion. I tell them to bring with them a small pair of binoculars or opera glasses. And part of the reason is you can't use your phone in there to like zoom in and see something or camera. You're not allowed to take any pictures in there. But because you're like this and you're bouncing around and you can't really see, it's hard to focus on stuff. And I will guarantee you that if you go in there with a small pair of binoculars and you're looking up, everyone who sees you doing it will be like, damn it, why didn't I think of that? You will be like a rock star. There. Now, of course, the most famous painting on the ceiling is the one that's smack in the middle of the room. It's the creation of Adam. Um, and it really is just, there's no words. There's no words, it's, believable. it's unbelievable. There's so many characters Michelangelo painted on the ceiling. There's all these prophets, there's all these different stories. It's the whole like Old Testament down the middle. Um, it's fantastic. The paintings on the lower parts of the wall are also beautiful. Um, this one is my favorite, um, this picture on the lower right. Um, this is Perugino and it's Christ giving the keys to Peter because Peter was the first Pope, right? So he's giving him like the keys, right? Like you're in charge now, I've got to go. Um, there's some really beautiful paintings in 
all of the Vatican museums. Um, you have to go through the Vatican Museum to get to the Sistine Chapel. Here too, you can take um, a beeline straight to the chapel. You can see all the things. The Vatican Museum on a whole is relatively small. It's not a big museum. You could walk the whole thing in like two hours. But um, there's wonderful art from ancient Rome and Greece. There's a nice Egyptian collection. And there are some amazing tapestries and paintings. It's, a, it's got a nice variety, but it's small. But most people come for this. They come, excuse me, for the Sistine Chapel. If you are a fan of Raphael, take the left turn, where everybody else is going right, they're going straight to the Sistine. If you are interested in Raphael, hang a left and go through the papal apartments because Raphael painted all those and they're magnificent. All right, so I'm finally out of the museums. I know, I could talk about art, art, art endlessly. Okay, so everybody know what this one is? This is Trevi Fountain. Rome is filled with fountains. They're all over the place. There's a good reason why there are so many fountains in Rome. Um, it was the only way to bring potable water to the public for thousands of years. So there is still all this water coming into the city. You know, in, the, in ancient times, it was to use the, the bathhouses, right? Because they had public bathhouses. And it was the way that everybody got fresh water. Of course, we have modern plumbing now, but there's still fountains, like everywhere you look. The biggest, most elaborate, and certainly the most famous of them is Trevi. This is literally the side of a building this, this is to scale, <laughs> this is the side of a building. And the whole thing doesn't even fit on my screen. It's too darn big. Um, and of course, most people do the traditional toss a coin in the fountain. That's what you do when you go to Trevi. Um, it's beautiful at night. There's a lot of people milling around it at night. Um, I, I've, been a, I've been past Trevi a few times and I swear every time I've seen somebody get proposed to in front of it. It's always thought to be this very romantic spot. Um, but people are over there chucking a coin over their shoulder to ensure they come back to Rome. It's a, it's a great little tradition, a little pop culture thing that really took off. Um, it's in this tiny little square in between other buildings. So it gets a little crowded, especially at night because it's so pretty. Um, but it's worth, it's worth a few minutes of your time to go check out Trevi Fountain. This is my happy place. This is the thing that I go to Rome for. This is the Pantheon. Um, it, again, it's got a fountain, another one of the many fountains in Rome, and it has an ancient Egyptian obelisk on top of it. But the building behind here, with all the columns and the portico and the pointy roof, um, this is the Pantheon. And the reason why I think the Pantheon is so very special is because, well, it's got a lot of things going on with it, but it's the most intact ancient building in the city because it never really fell out of disuse. So even when it was no longer a temple to all the gods, that's what Pantheon means, right? Um, it became a church, right? It was commandeered, if you will, by the Roman Catholic Church. So it was in constant use and therefore constantly maintained and upkept. So it looks like 95%, 90% of the way it always looked. And this was consecrated in 125. So again, this thing is, 1900 years old. Um, it's magnificent on the outside because it's like a forest of columns. It takes more than two people to reach around each column. Um, they're very big. And there's these big bronze doors here to walk through. But of course, it's the inside that is mind blowing. Um, it's got a beautiful marble floors, all these beautiful mar different colored marble decor. And all of this is um, original. Now there are things in here that are different. What would have been probably statues of ancient gods and goddesses have long been replaced with saints. Um, and there's a Christian mosaic above the altar, right? Because this is now a church. It's been a church for centuries. Um, and there's always pews in here, chairs in here, because there's mass in here every morning and every afternoon. Um, and um, there are some other things in here that are more modern. Um, there's monuments and memorials to famous Italians. Uh, and there's at least one, might be two, sarcophaguses. They're big, like ceremonial sarcophaguses to King Umberto the I think. Like it's, there's, there's history here because it's always been here um, for such a long time. But it's what happens when you look up that makes this place magnificent. And that is the dome. If the Colosseum is the progenitor of arenas, 
the Pantheon is the granddaddy of all domes. The dome of the Pantheon is, was by far the largest unsupported dome, not just in ancient times, but up until like the 1500s. Because it is a true engineering marvel. The, the Romans invented concrete. I mean, this ceiling, it has all these coffered squares for a reason. It's weight distribution, it's balance, it's all the stuff. But the things that, that, um, that make the space feel special, if you see in that little inset picture on the bottom here, Normally when you go into a building that has a dome, the dome is way up in the air. It's way above your head. Here, it's as if a, the sphere that would fill the dome also touches the floor. So you can feel like you're in a giant ball. Um, you know, if you're over at St. Peter's, the dome of St. Peter's is the same proportions, not quite the same size, but the same proportions as this dome. But if you put a ball in the dome at St. Peter's, it'd be hundreds of feet over your head because the church is so huge. In this building, it's like standing in a sphere and it feels that way. Um, there's a lot of really just genius engineering going on here, not the least of which is the hole in the roof. It's called the oculus, the eye of Rome. And it is, I wanna say it's 40 feet across. It's a big hole and it's where, it's where all the light comes from. And you can kind of see that there are rays of light, right? As the time of the day passes, it kind of moves, right? The shaft of light, rain falls through it. If it when it when it occasionally snows in Rome, snow falls through it. Um, but part of the reason why this dome is actually successful is because it's not supporting any weight at its apex. It's genius. It's genius, and one of the many reasons why I love this space. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of our Rome talk, there are piazzas everywhere in Rome. Um, they're big on their outdoor spaces. Not so much greenery, right? Paris, there's lots of greenery. There's a big park in Rome, but they have lots of piazzas and they're paved. Um, the bottom one here is the Campidoglio. It's surrounded by the mayoral palace in the middle and two museums on either side. And there's a statue of Marcus Aurelius, one of the emperors of Rome. Um, it, this is actually a bronze copy. The original is tucked into the museum over here to keep it out of the elements. Um, but another, this, is, this is a great place to park yourself with a gelato catch a little shade and people watch, just let it all soak in. Um, in the upper corner here, we've got the Piazza Navona. This is a long skinny piazza with um, a big fountain in the middle. It's called the Fountain of the Four Rivers. Uh, it also has a huge obelisk in it. There's actually more obelisks standing in Rome than there are standing in Alexandria, believe it or not. Um, but Piazza Navona is a great place. Um, there's some restaurants there. They're a little touristy, but there's restaurants here. Um, there's a couple of great gelaterias. Again, have gelato every day you are in Rome. Um, I always pick up something in here. I always chit chat with the artists and stuff. Um, it's a great place. I mean, of course there's kitschy stuff too, like you have a caricature done, um, but you can find some really beautiful stuff in here. Um, so um, outdoor art all over the place. In Paris, this is also true. Um, one of my favorite spots to just look at beautiful sculptures that it doesn't cost you a dime is the Ponte San Angelo, um, the Bridge of Angels, and it's in front of the Castle San Angelo. Um, and if you have seen Angels and Demons, this might look familiar to you. It was part of um, Dan Brown's book and Ron Howard's movie. The sculptures on this bridge, there are either 10 or 12 of them, I can never remember, but each angel has with it an attribute from the crucifixion of Christ. So this one, the closest I showed of this one has the spear. One of them has the crown of thorns. One of them has Veronica's veil. One of them has the dice. One of them has the cross. So each one of them is telling part of a story and whether or not you know the story, whether or not you really realize what they're doing, because they are inscribed, but they're inscribed in Latin. Like you have to know, right? But they're beautiful, and especially on a pretty day. Um, you know, it's just this gorgeous, dynamic, you know, flowing drapery sculpture um, on these beautiful angels. Um, you can also go in Castle San Angelo, that you could take a, a self guided tour in there. It's a fortress um, that was built in Roman times. And just like in the book Angels and Demons, it's true, there's actually a hidden passageway that goes from here. Oh, the way about a mile and a quarter down the road to the Vatican and it was an escape route for the popes if they were ever under threat. So that is true. 
Um, like I said, there's lots of churches in Rome. Um, you kind of can't throw a rock without hitting one. Some of them have really great things kind of tucked away inside of them. And this one is one of those. This is San Clemente. Um, it's a 13th century church. Um, and it's got beautiful uh, mosaics. It's got frescoes um, about the life of St. Catherine. It's got this gorgeous floor that's like this beautiful, beautiful uh, marble mosaic floor. But underneath it, pay the extra two bits and go underneath it. There's subterranean ancient Rome. There's a temple to Mithra, 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 Mithrides underneath. And it's like Roman streets and houses and stuff underneath this church. If you didn't go, you wouldn't know, which is why you use a travel agent. Okay, um, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, lots. There are open air archeological sites everywhere in Rome. Um, there's several forums. There's the Circus Maximus. I mean, there's things you've heard about, right? From movies and history and all this stuff. It's everywhere. And they all, there are lots of cats milling around. Um, there's also like, um, like all these other cities, tons of museums. Um, there's a whole numismatic museum that's filled with coins from ancient Rome. Um, the Borghese gallery was a palace to the famous Borghese family. They had a Pope or two in their family tree. Um, their palace is now this museum. This is the inside of their palace. Look at all this crazy marble and everything. Um, it's magnificent. Some of these places have always had the kind of, you need a timed ticket to get in because they're small. Um, I suspect most places will um, continue to do that because um, of the limited capacity issue that has happened because of COVID. And I think it's a good thing. Time tickets are great. It means you're not standing in queue for two hours just to go in someplace or waiting online outside in the hot to go up the, the Eiffel Tower. Time tickets are awesome. Um, of course, there's more history here than in the other, other cities we mentioned today. Um, 2,500 years in a very small area. Um, there's also all the history of the Catholic Church is right here, uh, most of it, um, and engineering marvels. I didn't even, I barely scratched the surface. Um, there are hidden gems in Rome, like there are in all these cities. Um, Santa Maria della Vittoria um, is this, looks like nothing from the outside, but inside, it's got the most magnificent sculptures. It's it's just bleh, like your chin's on the floor the whole time. Um, San Pietro and Vincoli is St. Peter in chains. The relic at this church are the chains, the, the, the actual like cuffs that St. Peter was arrested with. That's the relic here. Um, and then there's the whole Trastevere neighborhood. That's another one of those neighborhood kind of places like Montmartre where um, it's got a totally different vibe totally different thing going on. It's a beautiful place, parks and stuff. Lots of things in Rome to keep you busy, not the least of which, of course, is shopping. Um, I don't know how I've managed to go to Rome so many times and not buy a pair of shoes. It's it's taken like all the every ounce of willpower I own to just walk away without buying shoes. Um, but I buy lots of other stuff. Um, of course, there's souvenirs in all these cities. But like I said before, take advantage of the local specialties, right? Treat yourself. Do the thing, Christy, buy the shoes, right? Buy the, buy the shoes. Um, of course, there's the food, right? Like Paris, you kind of come to expect fantastic food in um, Italy. And I am a firm believer that if you're not eating gelato twice a day, you're not living. So have the gelato. Um, there's great little pizzerias all over the place. Um, Romans love pasta. You can have pasta or a pasta course with every meal and have a different one every time and be very happy about it. I mean, you got a carb load up a little bit, right? Walking around, you're doing all this stuff. Um, the most important piece of advice I always give my clients, um, and I, I will recommend particular restaurants sometimes, but I always tell them to ask their concierge a very different question. I don't, don't ask your concierge at the hotel to recommend a restaurant. They are happy to do that and they will recommend a restaurant in the neighborhood. And it'll be the kind that has a menu in English or French or whatever that you speak. If you want a different experience, if you want an authentic dining experience in Italy, ask a different question. So if you're there with your significant other, ask the person behind the counter, where would you go with your spouse for dinner? He's not going to send you to this restaurant over at Piazza Navona with the tourists because that's not where he would eat. 
if you're with your family, where would you take your family? If you want something super authentic, where would you take your mother? Nobody's going to go to go to one of these touristy spots with their mom if they live in Italy, right? Ask a better question, get a better answer. Have authentic local eats. And again, house wine, you're not going to have a problem with the house wine. Whew, feeling pretty good. You guys okay? Still hanging with me? Everybody all right? Um, so briefly, there's lots of ways to see these cities. Um, and, there, and there's lots of ways to make it suit you. And this is one of the reasons why working with a travel agent really makes sense. Um, you could use any of these cities as a base of operations, like stay put for the duration of your trip. Or it could be part of a bigger trip, like you're going to go to Paris, but then you're also going to go to other places in France. Um, it can be the start or the end of a cruise, right? A lot of people do river cruises in France. You can go from Paris north to Normandy, or you can do some of the other um, rivers and itineraries in uh, France, but you can bookend it, right? Start or end the trip in Paris. You can do cruises around Italy or about around Great Britain. And again, make Rome or London the start or end. So you kind of get an, a, an extra dose of where these cultures have so much to offer all in one spot. Um, of course, you can do them with, as part of an escorted tour. And that's where you don't have to think about anything. We just have to make sure we've got you on the right tour for you. Not all tours are made the same. Work with your agent. Um, there's also something called a hosted trip where you are by and large on your own, but there's a local host that's there to help you with questions, offer you recommendations. And if you wanted to do something spontaneous but needed tickets, they can hook you up. Or there's utterly independent. And that's something I, I specialize in for my clients too. I'm um, really build a very customized trip. Um, and we've talked about how easy it is to get around these cities when you're independent. So that's important. Like I said, you can do a weekend, a week or more. All of these cities have so much to offer. I can tell you, I've been to every one of them more than once and every time I go, I always say, I'll be back because they're inspiring. There's so much about them, food, wine, art, whatever it is that gets you excited. These cities are full of it um, and it's wonderful. We didn't even talk about the day trips that you could take from these cities. All of them have easy day trips. We mentioned Versailles, but all of them have great day trips. Um, and you can combine one city with another. Like I've done London and Paris on the same trip. Um, but you can, as part of a tour, you can do all three. Um, you could do two together or, or, or you can tack any of these cities onto another trip you're already taking in Europe. Because once you've crossed the ocean, it's very easy to tack something on, tack on London. Even if you're going to, you know, on a river cruise in Germany, but you've always wanted to go to London add it to the end or the beginning of the trip. It's very easy to do that. Work with a Europe specialist. You know one, it's me. <laughs> and I'm gonna just give you a plug for a special cruise I'm hosting next year. Next summer, I am hosting a whole bunch of my clients on a cruise around Italy. It's a nine night cruise. It departs from Rome, ends in Venice and it's got all sorts of wonderful things in the cruise. It's got a fantastic price that is very special just for my clients. If you are interested at all in this, I will be sending you this flyer so you have a chance to really read it. And um, we can talk about it. It's something that floats your boat. That's a cruise, it's a celebrity cruise. I've talked about a little bit of this tonight. There's a lot of great reasons to work with your travel agent. Um, totally tailored trip. It's not about just picking something off the shelf. It's got to fit you. It's got to suit the reasons you want to go. And that's what working with an agent can do. I'm always on the lookout for deals and discounts. It's important for me, for you to get the value um, of your vacation dollar um, done well. I want it to be a stress-free experience. I want you to go and have the time of your life. I don't want you worrying about a thing. More importantly, I'm always your advocate. Part of that is my job educating you before you make your plans. Part of it's about giving you great information so you know how to make great decisions. But Right now, it's also really important because I'm look, I've got your back during whatever this pandemic thing is still, right? I've gotten back 98% of every dollar spent for my clients' canceled vacations last year. 98%. I'm going to work for my clients. 
And I'm also a travel safety verified agency. Um, you can read more about this on my website. I'll show you the link in a minute. Um, but it's my job to make sure you're going safe. It's my job to make sure you are educated so you know that you're, you're, you're addressing your own risk tolerance. You're, you're educated to know what's different and new all the time. Um, it's my job to be in the know and it's my job to share it with you. Um, so you can learn more about that on my website. So now what? Ah. Well, if you are interested in booking a vacation to any of these three cities between now and the end of May for travel this year or next year, and there is going to be travel this year, people, this fall, I'm telling you, we're going, um, then you may be eligible for up to a $250 discount on your trip. So if you are interested, you're going to get in touch with me and this is how. My phone, my email, if you aren't already on my email list, you will be. So you'll get um, a follow-up to this, like I said, with that flyer. Um, please follow me on social media. And by all means, go to my website, escapeartistholidays.com, and enter this new contest. It's our Luxury River Cruise Giveaway with Ama Waterways. Contest just started. If you've been entered in any of my past contests, re-enter this. It doesn't hurt. It, you got to be in it to win it. Um, but we're giving away a cruise. I think the drawing is July 14th, 18th, something like that. So please sign up. And we are going to continue these events for at least another month. I think I'm going to take the summer off. Um, but if you are interested in any of our upcoming events or to see recordings of our past events, you can go to this link on the bottom here, bit.ly. We will travel again events <coughs> to learn more about all of that. So I wanna thank everybody for being here. Um, it was a really nice evening. I managed to do it in an hour and 20 minutes. When I rehearsed it today, it was two hours long. So I was fast and I'm parched. <laughs> but I hope you guys enjoyed tonight. I hope you enjoyed a, a little escapism with me to Europe. And if and when you are ready, by all means, please reach out, give me a call. I'd be only too happy to help you take your next dream vacation, whether it's here or anywhere else. Have a great night. Be safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you again soon.